In the last episode of The Hidden Hand Behind UFOs, the foundations for a new world order was established by leading scientific managers of the decaying 19th century British Empire. These leading social engineers recognized that in order to save their collapsing system of world empire, it was necessary to sabotage the emergence of cooperating independent nation states then springing to life across the globe. To do this, a new, more sophisticated science of control needed to be created in short order. As Thomas Huxley's X Club was created to establish a control over the realm of science, extending laws of the jungle and survival of the fittest over the weakest onto the human domain, Huxley's protege, Herbert George Wells, went to work pioneering a new genre of entertainment dubbed science fiction. In this powerful new realm of warfare that acted upon the imagination of a vast target audience, ideas pertaining to the nature of reality, technology, and most importantly, the future, could be infused into the collective imagination. This misuse of science fiction as a tool for mass manipulation and cultural warfare would shape a new set of modern myths about humanity's origins and destiny. Throughout Wells' many fictional stories, evolutionarily superior alien races acting like new immortal gods threatening humanity would be a recurring theme. The idea of uniting humanity under a world government out of fear of alien forces from beyond has played out across countless films, books, and television shows during the 20th century, but its origins are to be found in the mind of Wells. Meanwhile, Wells' concepts of technology and government would also provide a blueprint for the creation of the atomic bomb, the Manhattan Project, and even post-war efforts at a world government under a renewed British Empire, trumpeted as a League of Nations. Disciples of Wells not only oversaw this new age of secret science projects, but additionally advanced Wells' vision for a new science of control outlined in non-fiction books such as The Open Conspiracy, The New World Order, and The World Brain. The practical application of these ideas took the form of the science of cybernetics developed during World War II and became the instrument of control by a small managerial elite in positions of bureaucratic influence across Western governments in the post-war age. It is here that our story will resume. was a strange year. The Cold War had just begun. The USA-UK Signals Agreement that would create an organization known as the Five Eyes was launched, establishing the Anglo-American Special Relationship, and a new intelligence agency named the CIA was created after a vast purge of patriots from US intelligence. Additionally, Hundreds of civilian and Air Force personnel began noticing something out of the ordinary in the skies above. On June 24, 1947, American businessman Kenneth Arnold testified that he had witnessed nine unidentified flying objects in the skies of Washington, setting off a flurry of similar accounts which were reported to press agencies across England and the USA. By the end of the year, Nearly 750 sightings of unidentified flying objects had occurred. The question was, why were these objects appearing now? And of all the nations on the Earth, why were they specifically appearing near military bases in the USA and England alone? Were they new human-made weapons? Was it Russian aircraft preparing to attack the West? Or was it something else? It didn't take long for government officials to launch inquiries into these sightings in the forms of Project Sign in 1947 and Project Grudge in 1948. Rather than address the nature of these sightings responsibly, the architects of both projects took a strange position which only served to inflame suspicion of extraterrestrial cover-up among the broad base of the population as well as figures within the US military itself. 
These early government UFO commissions adopted the following strange modus operandi. First, attempt to explain away all sightings scientifically by stating that they were simply weather balloons, meteorites, swamp gas, or refracted light. When those explanations should fail, simply deny that any sightings had ever been made while threatening government officials from speaking publicly of what they had seen with jail time, court-martial, or drastic fines. The protocols of Project Sign and Grudge were amplified by the much larger British government inquiry dubbed the 1950 Flying Saucer Working Party overseen by Sir Henry Tizard, following the orders of Lord Louis Mountbatten. Lord Mountbatten was among the most powerful administrators of the British Empire, having been Supreme Allied Commander of Southeast Asia during World War II, First Sea Lord of the British Navy, and Governor General and Viceroy of India, where he undermined the dream of Indian independence by carving up the nation into warring factions. Lord Mountbatten's devotion to the cause of world empire and the replacement of sovereign nation-states with a centralized world government under British control reflected the same cause as that outlined by H. G. Wells much earlier. From 1952 to 1961, Mountbatten advanced this agenda as NATO commander of the Allied forces of the Mediterranean and chairman of NATO's military committee, where he directly oversaw the growth of dozens of coups and assassinations of nationalist leaders resistant to the New World Order. It is with these facts in mind that it becomes interesting to note that Lord Mountbatten was among the earliest and highest profile promoters of UFOs, having advanced the story that a flying saucer had landed on his property in Romsey, Hampshire in 1955. Long before it was popular to speak publicly about ETs, Mountbatten mused about the arrival of aliens to Earth, saying, If they really come over in a big way, that might settle the capitalist communist war. If the human race wishes to survive, they must band together. Mountbatten's words were an echo of British Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden's March 1947 statement. Sometimes I think the people of this distracted planet will never really get together until they find someone in Mars to get mad against. As we shall come to see, the idea of uniting humanity around a common threat driven by aliens from another world, as well as the nuclear bomb developed by Wells's followers, was a recurring theme throughout the Cold War. Wielding the authority of the British Empire, Mountbatten deployed Sir Henry Tizard, chief scientist for the UK's Ministry of Defence and overseer of the Manhattan Project in the USA, to create the UK Flying Saucer Working Party in 1950. The UFO Working Party had five members representing the elite technical intelligence branches of the Air Ministry, Admiralty, War Office and Ministry of Defence and ran for eight months investigating hundreds of sightings. The effect of the committee's inquiry and classified report to Prime Minister Winston Churchill transformed the culture of the military and created a climate of UFO intrigue throughout all branches of the US and British militaries alike. Sir Tizard's UFO working party interfaced closely with the CIA and directly inspired Project Blue Book in America, which ran continuously from 1952 until 1969. Across all of these government inquiries into UFOs, in no circumstances was any attention given to the possibility that human-made flying saucers were responsible for the sightings. For if this admission had been permitted by any of those Anglo-American commissions, then an uncomfortable fact would certainly have come to light. Namely, that the same secret science program that generated the atomic bomb had not only continued in secret after the war's end, but grew in scope and scale. Now you might be asking, what possible human origins for flying saucers could have been covered up during these early Cold War years? Let's explore that.
Despite the fact that much information has been suppressed to this day, it is known that as early as 1937, German aerospace engineers working under the Nazis' Panamunda Army Research Center had developed a large department to explore new designs for aerial vehicles that would overcome certain limitations in conventional aviation and rocketry. What came to be known as flying disks satisfied several engineering challenges by creating designs that would be very difficult to capture on radar, while also overcoming the drag caused by the motion of air sheets moving across the wings of planes. In 1936, Professor Ludwig Prandl at the Aerodynamic Research Facility of Göttingen University proposed the first solution to a problem known as the bounded layer effect, which had been preventing the development of supersonic flight. Pondel did this by introducing circular wings, which provided a partial solution but didn't fully resolve the problem. In 1939, Professor Prandl's designs were picked up by Dr. Alexander Lipisch, who designed a new form of suction technology which absorbed external air into the operation of the aircraft, which also involved Prandl's circular wings. This design was dubbed J1253 and was tested at the Göttingen Wind Tunnel in 1941. Rocket scientists Rudolf Scheibe and Otto Habermol officially called these designs the Flugscheibe, or flying disks. Soon, breakthroughs were made as Dr. Heinrich Miethe and the brilliant Italian engineer Giuseppe Bolonzo, both experts in fluid dynamics, began designing rotating circular aircraft that would allow for high degrees of maneuverability, speed, and the utilization of hypergolic fuels developed by Germany during the war. These were fuels made up of liquid, powder, dust, or gas substances that combusted upon combination. These early German flying saucer designs may have even provided the solution for overcoming the sound barrier without the typical sonic booms caused by conventional aircraft. One prominent member of the Panamunda team was the Austrian scientist Victor Schauberger. Victor Schauberger, whose innovative designs for implosion flying technology, utilizing water currents and electromagnetism to generate flying machines, played an important role within Panamunda. Soon, Schauberger found himself, like so many other German scientists, absorbed into America's secret post-war science program through such operations as Project Paperclip. By 1952, Schauberger had found himself involved with Canada's Avro Aero program, which sought his designs for supersonic nuclear missile delivery aircraft. As the story goes, when he discovered that his work would only be used for military purposes, Victor Schauberger pushed back and over the course of several months saw his patent stolen as he returned to Austria only to die a few days later. Schauberger's grandson described the injustice that beset the great scientist, saying, In the end, my grandfather signed a contract in which he transferred the rights to all his ideas, all his patents and thoughts to an American consortium just so that he could fly back home again. And as you know, five days later, after he was back home, he died. After many of Penemunda's scientists were absorbed into the Anglo-American secret science apparatus after World War II, their designs disappeared and cutting-edge innovations fell under the veil of secrecy. Despite the secrecy, important evidence into the continuation of flying saucer designs after 1945 can be gleaned by such declassified programs as the American Silverbug Project and Avro Aero's Project 1794. The fact was that those advanced technologies acquired as the spoils of war needed to be tested. And testing meant that both civilians living near air bases and even many unvetted military officials would foreseeably notice strange flying craft in the skies above. So, if preventing sightings was impossible, then of course the next best question was how to control the narrative explaining what those witnesses would be seeing. 
How could a story be spun that both satisfied the visual evidence of these unexplained aircraft, while also incubating the seeds for a new set of sacred stories that could shape humanity's deepest held beliefs about existence in the coming post-national age of world government? A clue to this answer could be gleaned by the words from CIA director Walter Bedell Smith, who wrote to the director of the New Psychology Strategy Board of the CIA in 1952, saying, I am today transmitting to the National Security Council a proposal in which it is concluded that the problems associated with unidentified flying objects appear to have implications for psychological warfare as well as for intelligence and operations. I suggest that we discuss at an early board meeting the possible offensive and defensive utilization of these phenomena for psychological warfare purposes. Bedell Smith's words were echoed by the leaders of the new CIA-run UFO Investigation Commission, dubbed the Robertson Panel, overseen by a Manhattan Project quantum physicist named Howard P. Robertson. After World War II, Robertson had become a classified CIA employee in the office of the Secretary of Defense and scientific advisor to NATO's Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, where he would have worked in close proximity to none other than Lord Louis Mountbatten. Following the lead from Sir Henry Tizard's UFO working party, the Robertson panel officially recommended that the Air Force begin to train all personnel to report on UFO sightings. It also recommended that civilian UFO groups be monitored because of their potentially great influence on mass thinking if widespread sightings should occur. Their apparent irresponsibility and the possible use of such groups for subversive purposes should be kept in mind. Here one wonders if CIA Director Roscoe Hillencoder's later role as director of the largest Cold War civilian UFO group the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena had more to do with CIA manipulation of the public and less to do with Hillencoder's devotion to UFO disclosure. In the Robertson panel's final report, it was noted that a discovery of extraterrestrial artifacts would be of immediate and great concern to not only the USA, but all countries nothing like a common threat to unite peoples. Again, the theme laid out by H.G. Wells, Lord Mountbatten, and Sir Tizard of humanity united around the fear of alien invaders raised its ugly head once more. It was increasingly clear that the minds of the population had become the dominant battlefield where the Cold War would now be waged. It was a full-spectrum war that involved the promotion of drastically conflicting narratives by Western intelligence agencies in order to create an atmosphere of confusion, doubt, and speculation. Within such an atmosphere of chaos, a gullible and fear-driven new consumerist population would easily be distracted from the reality of the shadow government taking over their nations. While Project Grudge, Project Sign, and Project Blue Book officially denied the existence of alien encounters, even threatening a $10,000 fine on military personnel reporting their sightings to the press, another simultaneous policy promoting ET narratives to the public began to occur. In an April 1952 edition of Henry Luce's Life magazine titled Have We Visitors from Space? An official message from the highest offices of the U.S. Air Force was delivered to a credulous American audience, saying, Discs, cylinders, and similar objects of geometrical form, luminous quality and solid nature for several years, have been, and may be now, actually present in the atmosphere of the Earth. These objects cannot be explained by present science as natural phenomena, but solely as artificial devices created and operated by a high intelligence. And finally, no power plant known or projected on Earth could account for the performance of these devices. One must wonder how the Air Force's policy of publicizing artificial devices operated by a high intelligence not made from this Earth 
could be publicly promoted on the one hand, while the same Air Force frantically suppressed all discussion of UFOs on the other. Could it be that these apparently contradictory narratives were simply two sides of one psychological warfare experiment carried out on the minds of Americans? It is here that the role of media mogul Henry Luce, owner of Time, Life, and Fortune magazines, becomes extremely interesting. Henry Luce was not merely a self-professed fascist and sponsor of American fascism prior to the war, placing Benito Mussolini on his magazine covers extensively from 1923 until the fascist leader's death, but Luce was also closely allied to the Rockefeller Foundation. Working alongside the Rockefellers and using his own media outlets, Luce advanced a new imperial vision for an American empire, publishing The American Century in 1941. In this influential manifesto, Luce called for the USA to abandon its historical antagonism to global empire and instead embrace its destiny as the dominant hegemon of a new world empire. Luce was closely aligned with the same Rockefeller Foundation that had funded the War of the Worlds broadcast in 1938 and joined the elite 1956 Special Studies Project funded by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund alongside Lawrence Rockefeller, David Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller, and a young Henry Kissinger, writing in Prospects for America that it was and is the American task to take the lead in creating a new form of world order. Henry Luce was also an early propagandist for another branch of the Cold War secret science program, dubbed MKUltra. No actual comprehension of the hidden hand behind UFOs could be understood without an appreciation for MKUltra and the rise of a new drug-laced spirituality. MKUltra was a vast secret science program which was revealed publicly during the Church Committee hearings of 1975. Between 1953 and 1973, MKUltra involved a vast complex of thousands of projects and sub-projects that developed a wide array of psychoactive drugs, hypnosis, trauma-based mind control, techniques of sexual abuse, sensory deprivation, electroshock therapy, and psychological torture more broadly. These horrific experiments carried out on millions of civilians involved the application of psychiatric theories premised on a mixture of Sigmund Freud, Pavlov, the founder of behaviorism, and Carl Jung. Just as the British Empire's leading scientist, Sir Henry Tizard, oversaw the Manhattan Project during the 1940 Tizard Commission to Washington, and just as the same Sir Henry Tizard oversaw the largest government inquiry into UFOs with his 1950 Flying Saucer Working Party, we shouldn't be surprised to again find Sir Tizard hard at work here too as the initiator of MKUltra. In her book The Shock Doctrine, Naomi Klein writes of a high-level meeting in Montreal, Canada overseen by Sir Tizard in 1951. One of the most controversial meetings Henry Tizard had to attend in his capacity as chair of the National Research Commission would only emerge many years later with the declassification of CIA documents namely a meeting on June 1, 1951, at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Montreal, Canada, between Tizard, Amon Salant, Chairman of Defense Research and Development Canada, and representatives of the CIA to discuss brainwashing. This Ritz-Carlton meeting on brainwashing would lay the seeds for MKUltra, which innovated new uses for LSD, psilocybin, and DMT with the intention of breaking down a human mind into a blank slate through depatterning in order to then reconstruct those broken minds from scratch.
Although commonly believed to be simply a popular vice or recreational activity, the fact is that a wide assortment of hallucinogenic drugs have been used since ancient times as part of initiation ceremonies into various pagan mystery religions such as the Rites of Eleusis. In World War II, the Swiss chemist Dr. Albert Hoffmann found himself working on strains of ergot, a fungus that grows on wheat which he found contained strong hallucinogenic properties. Dr. Hoffmann extracted a substance called lysergic acid dithylamide from this ergot in 1943, which became known far and wide as LSD-25. Throughout the Cold War, Hoffman's LSD-25 continued to be developed by MI6 and the CIA and tested on millions of unsuspecting human guinea pigs across the military, schools, and psychiatric hospitals of America, Canada, and England. In 1974, Dr. Hoffman wrote a book dubbed The Road to Eleusis alongside former J.P. Morgan Vice President Gordon Wasson, which posited that this hallucinogenic substance had been known to the priests of the ancient mystery religions, which used a myriad of psychoactive drugs from opium to mushrooms and ergot to induce altered states during initiation ceremonies. It was the view of the authors of The Road to Eleusis that the time had come to revive these ancient practices in the modern age. It is here again that we find Henry Luce as pioneer of MKUltra propaganda, with his Life magazine being the first major press agency to promote the notion that psychedelic mushrooms were a gateway to a new spiritual liberation. This was accomplished through the 1957 publication of J.P. Morgan Vice President R. Gordon Wasson's article, Seeking the Magic Mushroom, documenting the banker's CIA-sponsored 1955 hallucinogenic pilgrimage to Mexico. Wasson's highly publicized report in Life magazine and nationwide speaking tour to hundreds of universities served as a guidebook for millions of young beatniks and hippies who would follow his footsteps into their own drug-induced initiation ceremonies in the coming decades. These countless young admirers of Wasson would learn to shed their outdated beliefs in nationalism, family traditions, morality, and God in favor of a radically new, sexualized, drug-laced spirituality. Apparently, the only people over 30 whom the burgeoning New Age movement were expected to trust were those old people giving away free drugs. One of those early disciples of Wasson was a man named Terence McKenna, who throughout the 1980s and 1990s did the most to promote psilocybins through his Green Earth Foundation, which found vast patronage from none other than Lawrence Rockefeller. McKenna distinguished himself by not only promoting psilocybins, but also added his own thesis that benevolent aliens communicate to humanity via these mind drugs. Apparently, getting high was all that humanity's elites need to do in order to communicate with advanced ETs in other dimensions, who have been kind enough to give us those technologies needed to build pyramids, Taj Mahals, or even modern science itself. The unification of extraterrestrial communication and psychoactive drugs became a normal component of the New Age cosmology and played a role in Lawrence Rockefeller's creation of the Disclosure Project in 1992, employing a former military physician named Stephen Greer as its spokesman. Over the coming years, the Disclosure Project served as an umbrella organization tying together hundreds of UFO truth groups under a unified control as the Soviet Union collapsed winning the support of key figures within the new Clinton White House, including both Bill and Hillary Clinton, as well as John Podesta. It was while following Lawrence Rockefeller's initiative that Bill Clinton released thousands of classified UFO documents to the public in 1993, and it was also during this time that Hillary began visiting Lawrence's ranch. John Podesta made his UFO coming out party widely known in 2002 and has continued to devote himself to UFO disclosure for the next 22 years. The irony that a J.P. Morgan vice president, a Rockefeller family patriarch, and a fascist media mogul would become patrons of the counterculture was lost on many. 
It is also worth noting that Henry Luce was not just a promoter of magic mushrooms and aliens, but was also an avid consumer of LSD-25 and did more than anyone alive to popularize this drug as well. Luce's biographer, Stephen Siff, wrote of the mogul's embrace of LSD. Time and life were fascinated by LSD. Henry Luce's magazines discovered LSD in 1954 and remained enthusiastic even as the drug was becoming popular with recreational users, frequently discussing the experience in an explicitly biblical framework. Scare stories were balanced with endorsements of LSD by professors, businessmen, and celebrities, and some articles even read like advertisements. Many people have come to believe that the drug culture of the 1960s happened despite the CIA or Wall Street tycoons. But the facts show that it was the CIA and military intelligence that developed those drugs which users have come to see as their spiritual liberation. Additionally, by promoting drugs as a key to mental health, personal liberation, and even religious experiences, Henry Luce and Gordon Wasson were acting entirely as agents of the CIA and MKUltra. MKUltra itself was overseen by CIA director Alan Dulles, as well as the American chemist and spymaster Sidney Gottlieb, who both managed a vast array of experiments across North America. In the CIA's Harvard Psilocybin Project, founded in 1958, a devoted disciple of both Dulles and Carl Jung, named Dr. Henry Murray, used talented young students as test cases with a star guinea pig named Theodore Kaczynski coming out of the experience with a strange desire to murder anyone who promoted industrial civilization. After sending out murderous letter bombs across America, Kaczynski won infamy and even a vast cult following as the Unabomber. Other controllers of the Harvard Psilocybin Project included one Richard Alpert, later known as Ram Dass, Aldous Huxley, and a certain LSD-loving psychiatry teacher named Timothy Leary. All three individuals soon joined Gordon Wasson, Albert Hoffman, and Henry Luce as gurus of the newly forming counterculture, where they pioneered a New Age movement based on an embrace of ancient pagan mysticism, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. In 1961, Aldous Huxley described the importance of these new CIA brain drugs to Timothy Leary. These brain drugs, mass-produced in the laboratories, will bring about vast changes in society. This will happen with or without you or me. All we can do is spread the word. The obstacle to this evolution, Timothy, is the Bible. Leary then reflected on the obstacles they encountered as they sought to flesh out their vision of a new enlightened world religion. We had run up against the Judeo-Christian commitment to one God, one religion, one reality that has cursed Europe for centuries and America since our founding days. Drugs that open the mind to multiple realities inevitably lead to a polytheistic view of the universe. We sense that the time for a new humanist religion based on intelligence, good-natured pluralism, and scientific paganism had arrived. America's secret science program proved terribly effective as an entire generation watched their world go dark as the United States, once a beacon of freedom, now embarked on a new age of militarism abroad, consumerism at home, and CIA assassination programs everywhere. With this conversion of the Republic into a corrupt expansionist empire, the stage was set for a new reactionary youth movement ready to embrace a new religion based on drugs, sex, and alien gods. Not 
not all scientists who had worked within the corridors of America's secret science program could be accused of being complicit in this dystopic agenda, however. One example is found in the figure of Manhattan Project chemist Dr. Leon Davidson, who soon became a leading expert on unidentified flying objects. Unlike other self-proclaimed UFO experts of his day, Dr. Davidson was not politically naive and diligently exposed the hand of Alan Dulles behind the grooming of a new belief in aliens. Dr. Davidson also took astute notice of the important role in this affair played by Alan Dulles's fellow OSS agent and mentor, Carl Jung. Davidson was among the very few truth seekers who recognized that Carl Jung's 1954 book, Flying Saucers, A Modern Myth of Things Seen in the Sky, was nothing short of a manual for social engineering and mass hypnosis in shaping a new religious order. Davidson wrote, It became clear to me early in the 1950s that the CIA, specifically Alan Dulles, had used legitimate civilian observations of flying saucers events as a tool in the Cold War. Dulles wanted Russia to waste effort on defenses against objects having the extreme capabilities implied by the public saucer stories. Dulles also adopted a concept from his old friend Carl Jung and co-opted the myth that benign aliens have visited Earth for millennia. He used magicians' illusions, tricks, and showmanship to blend in sightings, landings, and contacts with the legitimate military test sightings. Later, Dulles found the saucer believers and their clubs an ideal propaganda vehicle. It should be recalled that Carl Jung saw himself as a modern sorcerer who believed it his destiny to overthrow Christianity by restoring a Dionysian Gnostic paganism. This aim was made explicit by Jung, who wrote of this new pagan revival in a 1912 letter to Sigmund Freud. I think we must give it time to infiltrate into people from many centers, to revivify among intellectuals a feeling for symbol and myth, ever so gently to transform Christ back into the soothsaying God of the vine, which he was, and in this way absorb those ecstatic instinctual forces of Christianity for the one purpose of making the cult and the sacred myths what they once were. A drunken feast of joy where man regained the ethos and holiness of an animal. Despite being hailed as a great psychologist to this day, the fact is that Jung was nothing short of a sun-worshipping occultist obsessed with reviving the ancient mystery cults outlined by Wasson and Hoffman in The Road to Eleusis. Jung had also believed that he was himself an initiate, having come into contact with several demonic entities over the years with names such as Philemon and Abraxas. Jung believed that the high initiate of secret mysteries would become liberated of all dualisms of right and wrong imposed on us by culture, as light and darkness and goodness and evil were integrated within ourselves. Through this exercise, which of course involved the use of mind-altering drugs, the initiate would become essentially God. Jung describes his own awakening to his deification in a 1925 lecture. Awe surrounds the mysteries, particularly the mysteries of deification. This was one of the most important of the mysteries. It gave certainty of immortality. One gets a peculiar feeling from being put through such an initiation. The important part of that led up to the deification was the snakes and coiling of me. The animal face which I felt mine transformed into was the famous Deus Leontocephalus of the Mitraic Mysteries, the figure which is represented with a snake coiled around a man, the snake's head resting on the man's head, and the face of the man that of a lion. This statue has only been found in the mystery grottos, the underchurches, Mitraeum, the last remnants of the catacombs. 
Jung's account of his deification hinged on the ancient Persian solar deity Mithra, which had been imported into Rome under the leadership of Rome's general Pompey in 60 BC. The cult of Mithra became the most important religion rivaling the early Christian movement during the first four centuries after the death of Jesus. The male-only mystery religion was a favorite among Rome's Praetorian guards and elite legion and operated in close proximity to the Earth Mother cult of Cybele and Isis, whose temples were typically located in close proximity to Mithraic enclaves. All three cults practiced the rites of Eleusis. The Mithraic cult worshipped exclusively in underground caverns called Mithraeum, of which over 400 have been discovered across Europe and North Africa to this day. Jung wrote in Flying Saucers, a modern myth, UFOs have already led to the formation of a regular legend. Quite apart from the thousands of newspaper reports and articles, there is no whole literature on the subject. One thing is certain, they have become a living myth. We have here a golden opportunity of seeing how a legend is formed and how in a difficult and dark time for humanity a miraculous tale grows up of an attempted intervention by extraterrestrial heavenly powers. And this at the very time when human fantasy is seriously considering the possibility of space travel and of visiting or even invading other planets. Jung then turns his analysis of ETs inside out by casting it as a new global mythology that will usher in a post-Christian age of Aquarius. He also asserted that these ETs represented a mass archetypal projection of ourselves onto the schizophrenic gods which each higher initiate of the ancient mysteries deified themselves into becoming. Jung writes, The UFOs could easily be conceived as gods. They are impressive manifestations of totality, whose simple, round form portrays the archetype of the self, which, as we know from experience, plays the chief role in uniting apparently irreconcilable opposites, and is therefore best suited to compensate the split-mindedness of our age. It has a particularly important role to play among the other archetypes in that it is primarily the regulator and orderer of chaotic states, giving the personality the highest possible unity and wholeness. It creates the image of the divine human personality, the primordial man or anthropos, a Chen Yen, an Elijah who calls down fire from heaven, rises up to heaven in a fiery chariot and is a forerunner of the Messiah, the dogmatized figure of Christ, as well as of Kittle, the verdant one, who is another parallel to Elijah. Like him, he wanders over the earth as a human personification of Allah. At this point, it is important to re-emphasize that Jung was not merely a psychiatrist with a fetish for UFOs and ancient paganism, but was also a Swiss-based OSS agent during World War II, where he began a long-term relationship with Alan Dulles, advising him on matters of psychological warfare. Dr. Leon Davidson recognized the mass hypnotic trickery deployed by the new sorcerers of the CIA, then building up the edifice of a new sacred lore for humanity, when he exposed the sleight of hand known as radar spoofing in his 1959 essay, CIA plus ECM equals UFOs, How to Cause a Radar Sighting, where he wrote, I contend that since 1951, the CIA has caused or sponsored saucer sightings for its own purposes. By shrewd psychological manipulation, a series of normal events has been served up so as to appear as quite convincing evidence of extraterrestrial UFOs. By about 1950, ECM was standard equipment on our advanced bombers and was being developed for missiles. Advertisements started to appear about 1956 
showing that this equipment could be used for creating simulated targets for training radar operators. I quote from an article in Aviation Research and Development, March 1957, quote, a new radar moving target simulator system, which generates a display of up to six individual targets on any standard radar indicator, has been developed to train radar operators and for in-flight testing of airborne early warning personnel. Target positions, paths, and velocities can simulate realistic flight paths, speeds up to 10,000 knots, about 11,500 miles per hour, are easily generated. The target can be made to turn left or right. For each target, there is adjustment to provide a realistic scope presentation. In the 1960s, the CIA took radar deception to new levels under Project Palladium, redefining the art of projecting phantom aircraft on radar. Over the last several decades, Digital radio frequency units have been widely used by the U.S. Navy and Air Force, and proposals were made to use them to send false signals to Libya in the 1980s as part of a plan to overthrow President Gaddafi under a CIA program dubbed Vector. Project Vector proposed that the USA send false signals to Libyan radar systems that would cause sufficient internal confusion within Libya's military. Under the veil of this confusion, a regime change could be effected. When these plans were leaked to the press in 1986, the operation was abandoned. But the strategy was picked up yet again when Tehran's air defenses began picking up ghost aircraft on their radar in 2004, which was part of Dick Cheney's efforts to conduct regime change on Iran. There is ample reason to believe that this technology was used on Iran again in January of 2020 when Iranian radar operators detected an incoming missile which their air defenses shot down, only to realize in horror that what was destroyed was not a rocket, but a civilian airplane. As we evaluate the disturbing facts of this story, it is important to hold in mind that it was CIA Deputy Director Charles Cabell who had initiated Project Blue Book, which ran UFO investigations from 1952 until 1969. Additionally, it was Dulles's close colleague Richard Bissell who headed the CIA's Office of Policy Coordination, known as the Psychological Warfare Division of the CIA. While running psychological warfare and targeted assassinations of nationalist leaders around the globe, Richard Bissell founded and managed one of the most sensitive experimental aircraft testing facilities, dubbed Area 51. From its earliest days in 1955, experimental aircraft like the U-2 rocket, early drones, and even flying saucer technology were tested in the Mojave Desert under the veil of Cold War secrecy. Area 51 was one of dozens of military above top secret facilities overseen by the CIA and Air Force throughout the USA. Other prominent sites included the Walker Air Force Base in Roswell, New Mexico, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, Plant 42 in Palmdale, and the Dulce Air Force Base in New Mexico. The thick veil of secrecy over Area 51, which was only officially admitted to exist by the CIA in 2013, created a climate ripe for speculation and disinformation narratives. A lot of folks are taking the internet-fueled idea of st storming Area 51, where conspiracy theorists think the government has aliens on ice. The simultaneous role of Richard Bissell, Alan Dulles, and Charles Cabell as pioneers of the new UFO sacred lore and the CIA's directing role of America's drug culture should not be seen as disconnected from their role overseeing the transformation of the USA from a national republic into a global hegemon imposing its power via power military coups, financial warfare, and assassinations. 
And it is also no coincidence that all three men would be fired by President John F. Kennedy, who held a very different conception of America's role in the world than the dystopic nightmare advanced by the CIA and MI6. When President Kennedy discovered the scope of the CIA's renegade operations to enmesh the USA into a war with Vietnam, Cuba, and the Soviet Union, he reacted with a force of moral courage which Dulles did not believe possible. At the end of 1961, John F. Kennedy carried out a major purge of the CIA's top brass, including CIA Director Alan Dulles, Deputy Director Charles Cabell, and CIA Director of Plans Richard Bissell, stating that he would splinter the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter it into the winds. On October 11, 1963, President Kennedy passed National Security Action Memorandum 263 to begin a phased withdrawal of US troops from the new war in Vietnam, which Dulles's CIA had prepared for years. On September 20, 1963, President Kennedy delivered a groundbreaking speech to the United Nations calling for an end to the Cold War by introducing a new paradigm of cooperation through cutting-edge technologies developed in the space program as a basis for friendship between Russians and Americans. Finally, in a field where the United States and the Soviet Union have a special capacity in the field of space, there is room for new cooperation, for further joint efforts in the regulation and exploration of space. I include among these possibilities a joint expedition to the moon. Space offers no problems of sovereignty. By resolution of this assembly, the members of the United Nations have forsworn any claim to territorial rights in outer space or on celestial bodies and declare that international law and the United Nations Charter will apply. Why therefore should man's first flight to the moon be a matter of national competition? Why should the United States and the Soviet Union in preparing for such expeditions become involved in immense duplications of research, construction and expenditure? Kennedy understood that unless a positive mission based on creative discoveries and win-win cooperation could be accepted by the Russians and Americans alike, then it was only a matter of time before imperial thinking would lead the world inexorably towards thermonuclear annihilation. Unfortunately, only four weeks after Kennedy's offer for US-Russian space cooperation and three weeks after calling for ending the war in Vietnam, the president was murdered. With Kennedy's murder, followed by his brother's murder only five years later, the takeover of the USA proceeded much more aggressively. The cauldron of Vietnam lit Southeast Asia ablaze with the blood of millions of civilians and young American men for the coming decade. The war in Vietnam also incubated a new breed of Satanist that would soon become a vanguard inside of the US military, with figures such as Edward Lansdale, the Temple of Set's Colonel Michael Aquino, and ufologist Colonel John Alexander overseeing an overhaul of the US military. This revolution in military affairs was led by the Rockefeller-directed Trilateral Commission and implemented by Major General Albert Stubblebean, head of U.S. Army Intelligence and Security Command under Ronald Reagan. This new breed of military Satanist worked closely with General Stubblebean to bring MKUltra into the official corridors of U.S. military decision-making. Under their patronage, New Age spoonbenders emerged onto the scene. 
These were new military trainees who were taught that they could be modern Mithraic super soldiers or new Jedi Templar Knights. These soldiers were taught to astral project, destroy the hearts of their enemies with mind power, and run through walls with the help of drugs and hypnotism. Some of the official names for these new military training programs begun in 1978 were the 1st Earth Battalion, the Goat Lab, and the Jedi Warriors. Dr. Quino, the High Priest of the Church of Set, Temple of Set. One of the most important manifestos guiding this new military doctrine was co-written by Colonel Michael Aquino, the former lieutenant of Anton LaVey's Church of Satan, who created his own satanic church dubbed the Temple of Set after returning from Vietnam. The document in question was dubbed Mind War and called for a total war on the minds of the populations of the globe, both enemy and friendly alike using next-generation technologies and psychiatric techniques. Aquino writes, Mind war must be strategic in emphasis, with tactical applications playing a reinforcing, supplementary role. In its strategic context, mind war must reach out to friends, enemies, and neutrals alike across the globe. State-of-the-art developments in satellite communication, video recording techniques, and laser and optical transmission of broadcasts make possible a penetration of the minds of the world such as would have been inconceivable just a few years ago. Like the sword Excalibur, we have to but reach out and seize this tool and it can transform the world for us if we have the courage and the integrity to enhance civilization with it. If we do not accept Excalibur, then we relinquish our ability to inspire foreign cultures with our morality. If they can then desire moralities unsatisfactory to us, we have no choice but to fight them on a more brutish level. While this transformation of the US military was unfolding and America's soul was slipping away, Another of Lawrence Rockefeller's sponsored projects was bringing the new UFO religion into reality via the Stargate Project at the Stanford Research Institute. The Stargate Project attempted to create a scientific facade for paranormal activity, telepathy, and telekinesis using thousands of human guinea pigs and later fed into the revolution in military affairs, which ushered in the war against terrorism starting with Desert Storm in Iraq 9-11, and forever wars in the Middle East since 2001. This Rockefeller-funded program was staffed by several UFO-promoting scientists affiliated with U.S. military intelligence with names such as Harold Putoff, Ingo Swan, Jacques Vallée, and of course the shadowy figure J. Allen Hynek. J. Allen Hynek had been a controlling figure from the earliest days of the Cold War serving as the lead scientist on Project Grudge, Project Sign, and Project Blue Book. He had also consulted Steven Spielberg on the film E.T. and created the codification system for Close Encounters, including Close Encounters of the Third Kind, even being given a role within Spielberg's movie of the same name. Heineck also delivered speeches to the United Nations, calling for a worldwide agency and world database under a supranational control to monitor UFO sightings in preparation for a full disclosure of ET government collusion. It should be noted that until 1966, J. Allen Hynek played the role of anti-UFO rationalist, advancing the most absurd scientific theories to explain away thousands of UFO observations made by civilians. After 1966, however, something strange occurred as Hynek came out of the closet and became the world's loudest evangelist of UFO encounters and worked with his student Jacques Vallée to advance the interdimensional ET hypothesis by 1969, as outlined in Vallée's book, Passport to Magonia. This 1969 book 
popularized the notion that ETs were in fact interdimensional travelers shaping humanity's evolution, taking the form at times of demons, angels, poltergeists, and even found themselves recounted through folk tales of elves and fairies. Welcome back to On the Record. Dr. Jacques Vallée is an astro astrophysicist who provided the inspiration for the character of the French scientist in the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. In a recent interview, Jacques Vallée, who had been a friend of the Church of Satan's Anton LaVey, described the secretive Rosicrucian order of which both he and J. Allen Hynek were members. Dr. Vallée, how did you become interested in the order of the Rose Cross, and what value did it have in your growth and development? As a young student, I must have been 18 or 19 when I first became interested. I was really looking for information about traditions and became aware of the fact that science didn't just come out of the imagination of a few people, that there was a tradition of research that went very far back and that at some period in history had been actually underground. I was looking for information about that. That's what led me to the Rosicrucian tradition. I was surprised also to learn later on that Dr. Heineck was also a member for a number of years. Yes, I think I relate in my diary the time when we came to discussing this and I was delighted to learn that he had for many years gotten information from the tradition as well. Those organizations were very sincere and gave us a start. The mystery cult known as Rosicrucians originated in the early 15th century as a Gnostic sect of sorcerers who based their secret teachings on a mixture of ancient mystery cults, sex magic, hermeticism, alchemy, and Kabbalism. When the Templar Order was discovered to be practicing black magic and worshipping the androgynous demon Baphomet, the Mithraic sect of crusading mystic warriors was wiped out in the early 14th century. After this crushing defeat, the Rosicrucians became the new conduit for this anti-Christian sect devoted to creating a new order and a new type of humanity under a revived network of pagan deities overseen by necromancers and high priests. These new high priests would soon bring online a new UFO disclosure project called the National Institute for Discovery Science, funded by American billionaire Robert Bigelow and headquartered at a new occult command center named Skinwalker Ranch in Ballard, Utah. The National Institute for Discovery Science would work closely with Lawrence Rockefeller's disclosure project bankrolling UFO disclosure literature, conferences, and even sponsoring Senate House Leader Harry Reid, who passed legislation creating the Pentagon's Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program in 2007. This agency oversaw the creation of Tom DeLonge's To The Stars Academy in 2014, and did much to launch congressional hearings on UFOs, featuring testimonials from such military intelligence assets as David Grush and Luis Elizondo. Leading figures within the American Deep State could be found advising this new civilian UFO disclosure agency, including a former CIA Director of Operations, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Defense Intelligence, a former Director of Information for White House Technology, and a former chief of the CIA's Counter Biological Weapons Program. Throughout the Cold War, the mythology of extraterrestrial gods, both seeding and overseeing humanity's evolution across millennia, would be cultivated by the modern sorcerers of the CIA, following the template laid out by H.G. Wells and Carl Jung. The objective was never about aliens, UFOs, or disclosure, but was always about the creation of a new world religion, 
whose polytheistic deities and drug-laced rites of initiation would be overseen by a new class of technocratic priests, which came to be called social engineers or transhumanists. In our next episode, we will explore this takeover of Western culture in further detail with a look at the role of UFO cults, theosophy, and the continued crafting of new world religions.